We think if we just speak loudly enough, people will understand. <laughs> but it's not a matter of speaking more loudly or even more clearly. The issue is that simply giving people more information is not the answer. There's often this mentality of, if only you knew what I knew, then you'd believe what I believe, right? Wrong. So in the science of science communication, this is what's known as the deficit model. There's a lot of evidence and research showing that it just doesn't work, but it still drives a lot of our scientific outreach. But people are not empty vessels to be filled, right? This is not a data transfer from one ring to the other. Scientists dumping more information on society is not going to solve the problem. And that information is not enough is one of the most foundational concepts in the science of science communication. Despite that, a lot of science communication is still plagued by the assumptions of the deficit model. Instead, we need to shift to a model centered around dialogue and figure out how to engage people in conversation. Where listening to the perspectives and needs of others is just as important as being clear about what you bring to the table. And this is something that the panelists uh, spoke to earlier today, right, in terms of engaging with community members and engaging with social scientists themselves. So let's talk about one reason why dialogue is so important. In this photo, what do you see? Raise your hand if you think that this is a defensive foul. Um, what about an offensive foul? Got one hand, all right. Uh, raise your hand if you have no idea what's going on in this photo, just basketball. Okay, all right, all right, got a few hands there. Okay, well, usually what happens is um, people vote against whatever the local team has done, right? So the point here is, is that, that what's happening in this image itself is up for interpretation because we don't know what was happening before or what happened after. This is a snapshot. Um, and the other part, point of this is that we often see what we wanna see because we see the people that we are rooting for in the right. Um, so there's a lot of psychological evidence to back this up, except for what just happened here. Um, <laughs> in particular, a famous psychology experiment where researchers showed students from two Ivy League colleges, uh, a football game between their schools in which officials made a series of controversial calls. And the students attending the offending institution saw half as many illegal plays as students from the opposing institution. Uh, yeah, it's true. I guess I, well, I was thinking, you know, everybody's coming here, but it's not about LA. Anyway. Um, I live in Oregon. California is just one big flaw to me. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, okay, so despite that failed experiment, we will know or assume because I just told you that what we see is informed by our values. Okay. Um, so the next question is then, why is there such polarization? And there are really two key factors that social scientists have identified to begin to answer this question. One is that of cultural cognition, which looks at how cultural values shape our perceptions. Um, this growing area of social science research is demonstrating that people react to scientific evidence in much the same way as they decide who was fouling whom. We, and I say we to make it clear that those of us in this room are not immune to this we take positions that reinforce our cultural identity and accept or reject information based on that cultural identity and its associated values. Humans are social animals. At a fundamental level, our survival depends on maintaining social ties. And going against those ties is extremely difficult. We want to side with people that we trust, our tribe, so to speak, which means that we tend to disregard or reject opposing viewpoints. In some
sometimes that rejection extends to the actual people who hold those viewpoints. And we see this challenge play out a lot in politics, um, but many of us have personal experiences with this as well. So that's cultural cognition. The second factor that feeds into a lot of polarization is called motivated reasoning, which is the phenomenon that occurs when people cling for and cling to false beliefs, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, because they seek out information that confirms what they already believe. Um, Dan Kahan is a professor at uh, uh, Yale in um, Law and Psychology, and he has shown that Scientific literacy actually isn't a predictor of whether people believe in hot button issues such as climate change or gun control. Um, groups with opposing values often become more polarized, not less, when exposed to science. And that is because they actively resist the information that could threaten the defining values of their group. We all know that one person, at least, Right, you might even be related to them. I'm from Louisiana, so I'm related to a lot of them who are well-educated and seemingly reasonable people, but they have some really far out there views on controversial issues. And this, again, in particular, is a really foundational piece of the science of science communication. And unfortunately, motivated reasoning is even easier to do in this day and age with social media and echo chambers. Um, we can choose, actively choose, to only expose ourselves to media consistent with our pre-existing attitudes, which then, of course, just reinforces our opinions. I mean, I'm totally guilty of this, right? Okay, so here's another way that context matters. Um, who wants to tell me what they see here? You, if you've done this training, you don't get to tell me what you see here. I see a 13. A 13, all right. Who sees something else? I see a B. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, you can see a B or you can see a 13, right? So this is called the broken B experiment. Um, and as you just experienced, when the context around this image changes, you see different things. People interpret things based off of their own context. And I suspect you can think of all sorts of different social, religious, economic, cultural contexts in which you might be communicating your science. Those contexts mean something and they affect how what you share is received. So this is another fun one. Um, those of you who've been to the Sacramento Convention Center may have seen this as well. Anybody want to tell me what they see on the bench? Here the art, yeah. You want to see anything else? Heart, yeah. And earth. Oh, and heart the earth. Oh no, not quite heart the earth, but earth. You can still see it, it's true. So there are a lot of different things to see in this bench, right? And it's like, I, I love that. I saw this actually um, right before I was getting ready to give a plenary talk at a, a conference, and I was like, I have to take a picture and add this into my slide deck. The takeaway here is that when it comes to thinking about communicating your science, context and values matter. The way that people process information is strongly tied to their values and cultural identities. And understanding the lens through which your audience is looking, what they care about and what they value, can help you figure out how to connect with them effectively. So we talked about models of communication Shifting from a deficit model to one of engagement. We've talked about how part of this new model of engagement is dialogue, um, which requires meeting people where they're at and understanding that their values, as do yours, shape each of your perceptions of the world. And taking this context into account is essential to communicate with, not just to, your audience effectively. So another principle of effective science communication is that it requires both respect and trust. Um, when faced with making a decision about something, the research shows that we rely on social cues 
from people that we trust. So, what is trust based on? Susan Fisk is a professor of psychology at Princeton, and she's found that there are two primary dimensions to social perceptions of trust, warmth and competence. She's also found through her research that the perceived trustworthiness of, uh, that in the perceived trustworthiness of various professions, scientists are seen as competent but cold. One thing uh, I'd like to note about this is that there's a relative coarseness to this research because it's focused on groups of people, um, in this case, scientists as a whole. But social perceptions of an individual are gonna be much more nuanced and multifaceted, right? Job, gender, race, age, background, religion. All of that plays into social perceptions of individuals. So, but scientists as a whole, right? We have this warmth problem and thus a trust problem. So what can we as individuals do to help overcome the fact that we are lacking this crucial dimension of effective science communication? In their 2016 paper, researchers Anthony Dudo and John Beasley summarized that positive beliefs about science and scientists are more likely to stem from high quality interactions with likable and engaging scientists who are willing to listen. So there's some really great nuggets in here, so we're gonna break it down. High quality interactions. That means that you, the communicator, care not only about your work, but about the interaction itself, about the moment of connection between you and your audience. Likeable and engaging. And the word likable can really put people off, but I think about it as just another way to think about warmth. Um, and a critical dimension of warmth is being yourself, right? The idea of warmth isn't to become something you're not. It's not to be sickly sweet with everyone or that adorable teddy bear of a person, if that's not you, right? People can read that falseness. It's about being authentic. How can you be engaging? Speak from your why. Share your awe, as Christopher Joyce says. And this can be really hard and super challenging for scientists because we're trained so rigorously to keep ourselves as much as possible out, out of our science. But it's essential to put yourself into the story of your science if you want the audience to connect with your work. You have to share why you care. And lastly, listen. And this goes right to the heart of the engagement monologue. Uh, monologue. That's what I'm doing right now. Um, <laughs> engagement model. Um, making your science communication about dialogue. Explore a subject together rather than just delivering information. In a dialogue, when engaging in a two-way conversation, it's really important to show the other person that you want to understand them and where they're coming from. Listening to understand rather than listening to respond, which can be really hard when you have something really, really important to say. Even when you're trying to listen to understand, it's hard, right? And why? So one of the underlying reasons for this challenge to actually doing this is that we're often communicating across difference, different perspectives, values, experiences, and humans are wired to interact in agree, disagree mode. Your fast brain is always making decisions about what you think you should and shouldn't do or what you should and shouldn't agree on. We see things, we're wired to see things as black and white. But when we begin an interaction by listening to respond, we get caught in a cycle of disagree, defend, destroy. So this becomes all about being right or defeating or convincing the other person. If you're there, ready to disagree, you're trying to negate the other view before even communicating across that difference. And then you have to defend your perspective. No, you're wrong. And then of course the final step is to destroy your opponent. <laughs> I must 
When? Anyone familiar with this cycle, perhaps? <laughs> I am, definitely. Um, instead of preparing to argue, think about how you can enter a conversation trying to find points of alignment. Finding those points of connection. And as you do it, remember that this takes practice. You'll likely have to adjust your approach along the way because you're going to be learning about yourself as a communicator as well as learning more about your audience. Because again, at the heart of effective science communication is finding intersections between what you care about and what your audience cares about. As a personal example, in my previous work in coastal restoration in Louisiana, I often talked about my deep family roots and personal connection to Louisiana wetlands to convey to stakeholders that we were from the same place, loved the same place, and had the same goal in mind for our homeland, even if ultimately we had very different backgrounds. You don't necessarily have to get that personal, but it's at these points of connections, these shared goals between you and your audience, where a relationship built on trust begins, <laughs> begins and can really help catalyze connection from one-way dialogue to that two-way exchange of true engagement. And if this sounds like work, it's because it is. Every change requires effort, but people talking to people is still the way that norms and standards change. The what of your work is the easy thing to talk about. It's the default to many of our conversations. With your peers, you can dive a little deeper and talk about the how. The mechanisms for biological or community change, or perhaps your methods. At the core of what you do though, what motivates you as a scholar is your why. Whether or not you've actually articulated that for yourself. But think about it. If you only have five minutes of someone's time, they're more likely to listen to and remember your why than your what. Why your work matters is more likely to resonate with an audience, with a non-scientific audience in particular. And sharing your why builds that trust because it can help your audience understand you as an individual more. Um, so, if you don't know why you do what you do, how are you gonna make people care about it? Um, so I'm gonna give you a minute or two to write down your purpose. Think about it, think about it. 